Well, Hosh Gelden is ladies and gentlemen. I, uh, behalf of all my colleagues here in the African and Middle East Division, um, and Mary Jane D, who has uh, retired as of last week, but today is an honored guest. Um, I'd like to <laughs> extend a very warm welcome to everyone. And I'm Joan Weeks, head of the Near East section, who's the sponsor of today's program. And uh, this is in celebration of Women's History Month. And the presentation entitled Ottoman Princess Brides, Princess Nilifer in Hyderabad and a Visual Journey of Exile. But before we start today's program and introduce our speaker, I always like to give you a brief overview of the division and the resources in case you can come back and join us and do research in our Turkish collections particularly, but also extension of all the other collections that we cover. And uh, you can easily get a photo ID, reader card, just down on the first floor, and then come back in and use these collections. And we do have uh, one of the largest collections of Turkish and Ottoman books outside of Turkey. So uh, very impressive books for your use. And this is a custodial division. So we have three sections that build and serve the collections from uh, we cover 78 countries and over two dozen languages. So we have the African section that covers all of Sub-Saharan Africa, um, the Judaica section, Hebraic section that covers Judaica worldwide, and the Near East section that covers the Arab countries of North Africa, Turkey, Turkic Central Asia, Iran, Afghanistan, and the Muslims of Western China, Russia, and the Balkans. So it's very extensive. Armenia and Georgia are also included. And I'd like to invite you to try out our Four Corners blog. Our curators write very interesting stories about special aspects of the collections, and uh, it's just a few clicks away. We've left a little flyer here in your seat to check it out. And also, if you subscribe, you get alerts and notices about upcoming programs. And also, we have Facebook. So uh, we've got a little bookmark here for you, and uh, we have lots of interesting things from our Asian, as well as our Hispanic, European, and African Middle East reading room. So please try those out. And now, uh, just one last little item. If you ask questions at the end, we just want to remind you that the program is being webcast, so uh, you're giving your permission implicitly if you ask questions for it to be webcast later. Um, now, for our speaker. Dr. Betel Basharan received her PhD in Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations from the University of Chicago in 20, um, 2006, and now is Associate Professor of Religious Studies at St. Mary's College in Maryland, and specializes on the Islamic Middle East. Her primary area of expertise is social, economic, and legal history of the Ottoman Empire. She is the author of Salim III, Social Control and Policy in Istanbul at the End of the 18th Century Between Crisis and Order. And she's published a number of book chapters on the artisans and populations of Ottoman Istanbul. She's worked extensively in the Ottoman archives and taught Ottoman language at the University of Chicago and Georgetown University. Her work in progress includes a manuscript about the Ottoman princess Nilifer that we're going to hear about today, and who was married to the younger son of the ruling family of Hyderabad, India, after the abolition of the Islamic Caliphate in 1924. In 2016, Dr. Basharan directed a four-week National Endowment for the Humanities Summer Institute for college and university teachers at the Institute of Turkish Studies entitled Transcending Boundaries, the Ottoman Empire, Europe, and the Mediterranean World, 1500 to 1800. She is currently on sabbatical and a fellow at the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, D.C. for her project tentatively titled Cross-Cultural Intimacy and Marriage Between Foreigners and Women in Ottoman women in the early modern era. So without further ado, please welcome Betel Basharan to the podium.
Thank you very much. I'm going to lower this a little bit because I'm fairly short. It will interfere with the recording <laughs> if I don't do that. Thank you very much for coming and sharing your um, precious lunch hour with me today. It's great to see um, some old friends and some very old friends and uh, some, uh, some new ones as well. And uh, thank you for the introduction and the invitation, Joan. I really appreciate having the opportunity to use this platform as we celebrate Women's History Month. Maybe we should say Women's Her Story Month, but Women's History Month and the uh, opportunity to include Muslim women in our conversation. Their voices often are not heard or included in these discussions. So thank you very much again for inviting me. I was here a year ago, exactly a year ago, um, last year, and I talked about um, my research in the Ottoman Sharia courts. And today I'm going to talk about this new book project that I'm um, very enthusiastically involved in. And I'm trying a different kind of writing. I was uh, talking to some of you uh, before we started. Um, I'm trying to write this book as um, not a strictly academic publication, but something that's going to be geared more toward a popular audience and non-specialists. Um, those of you who have written anything know that it takes a really long time to actually write a book, and then you publish it and nobody gets to read it, and that's really painful. So hopefully it'll be different with this, uh, <laughs> with this project. But if you have any suggestions or ideas about how to make it more accessible, please, please let me know. I would really appreciate that. I also want to say a few words about the, my, my sources for this project before we start. You will see in some of my slides that um, Georgetown University special collections um, will, will come up. Um, and uh, it's a strange coincidence that the, um, a huge collection of uh, private letters uh, and photographs and correspondence belonging to uh, Princess Nilufer are now, were donated to the Georgetown uh, University Special Library, uh, Special Collections, the Booth Family Center. Um, and I'll talk briefly about it, but she remarried um, for a second time and married an American um, whom she met in Paris. And when she died, he remarried. And when he died, <laughs> his second wife uh, donated all of the papers and um, most of them, I think, not all of them, to the library. There's also a part of the collection that I haven't seen that is in um, the possession of a private collector. Um, he is uh, a gentleman by the name of uh, Arvind Acharya. He's a native of Hyderabad uh, and came to know the, uh, the family. And I'm not sure what exactly, but he has some of them in his own uh, possession. And uh, he was very generous with his time and came and went with me in DC uh, about two years, two years ago. And we talked about collaborating because he's made a few short films uh, on the princess and her work in, uh, in Hyderabad. They're on YouTube, you can find them. Um, and he doesn't read any Turkish sources and I don't speak or read Urdu. So it's a great uh, sort of collaborative effort. But the last time I had any contact with him was a year and a half ago. So I'm hopeful that we can, we can collaborate. So I'm working primarily with what's in the Georgetown archive. And this is a pretty extensive collection with, I believe, 27 boxes of, of correspondence in some personal uh, possession, small personal things, mainly photographs and letters and telegraphs and things of that sort. Most of the documents are in either modern Turkish or Ottoman Turkish, uh, and there's a lot in French because she um, grew up, pretty much grew up, she came of age in France, as we'll see. So that's a little bit of background, um, and uh, unless I state otherwise, my sources are, primary sources are mostly from, from that collection. All right, um, and I'm gonna ask Joan Anum to please help me with time because I'm really bad when it comes to time and I have a lot of material. Um, okay, so um, on the um, announcement, I, I made here a collage of, uh, of details from three different passports that Nilufer held during her life, um, and I'll talk about them um, as we go, but she had three or possibly four passports between 1924 and 1952. And they all correspond to very important tumultuous times in the history of the, of, of the 20th century uh, and had a direct impact on, on her mobility but also her, her life as well. Um, she was one of the 
um, many members, actually there were 155 members of the Ottoman royal family who were sent to exile after um, the caliphate was abolished in 1924. Um, but her life takes us through a fascinating story of exile from, from Turkey. So, so born in Ottoman Istanbul, but exile from Turkey to the French Riviera, and then followed by a period of royal glamour in Hyderabad because she became the princess of Hyderabad. Um, and then her, if I'm interested in her evolution into a very sort of modern um, type of princess, almost like a, a Princess Diana sort of figure in uh, early 20th century Hyderabad with the type of philanthropy work that she did and initiated and she became a pioneer for. And in my project, I use her uh, story as a case study through which I try to investigate these intertwined themes of politics, religion, royalty, and also women's agency in the Muslim world in the first half of the 20th century. So it's not a biography, strictly speaking. I'm not interested in covering her entire life, but looking at this time period as a, as a lens through which we can uh, think about these, these broader themes. And um, as I'm sure you're aware of here, many of you, there are very large audiences who are aware and informed about the fate of other dynasties, such as the Habsburgs, or the Romanov dynasty after the collapse of those empires, but we can't really say the same thing about the, uh, the Ottomans. So I had a few introductory slides for those of you who may not be familiar with Ottoman history. This one shows the extent of Ottoman realms in the, um, around 1700. And, um, and this map shows the various empires before World War I. Um, so all of these, German Empire, Austria-Hungarian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, um, the Romanovs in Russia, uh, they're mar not marked here, but the Qajar dynasty in Persia, these are all royal dynasties that came to an end in the early 20th century. Uh, so I'm interested in integrating the Ottoman Empire into this broader, broader story. Um, by the time we get to uh, the post-World War I era, um, this sort of purple area, today's Anatolia for the most part, is what's left of Turkey and it's, um, it's, oc it's occupied by uh, various different forces. So the, uh, the, um, uh, the Ottomans or the uh, Turks uh, fight after World War I, a war that's called, referred to as the War of Independence in Turkish history between 1919 and 1922 to um, to free these lands and establish the modern Republic of Turkey in 1923. But before that, in 1922, the um, National Assembly uh, first abolished the monarchy, uh, the Ottoman monarchy, but maintained the position of the caliph for a while. And then in 1924, also voted to abolish that institution, which we'll get to in a little bit. Um, so I'm interested in this era where these post-war treaties uh, and revolutions carved out new nation states and these new regimes also sealed the fate of the former imperial family. So what happens to these former members of monarchies once their regimes are overthrown? Um, and something rather interesting happened to the Ottomans. They weren't exiled and then executed like the Romanovs, for example, but all of them were deported. Um, for a lifetime at the time. So our princess Nilüfer was born in 1916 in, uh, in Ottoman Istanbul, which was later occupied by the Allied powers between 1918 and 23. Her mother, so on her mother's side, she's related to Sultan um, Murat V, who was the Ottoman monarch very briefly in 1876. Um, and her father was um, not from the, um, royal family, but uh, he was from a prominent member of the Ottoman court, but he dies very early on. We don't know much about him. He died either when she was two or four, so she was a toddler. She was very young. Um, so 1924, she's eight years old, and the Nash Turkish National Assembly passes this law that um, condemns all 155 members. This is including, so it's not just the household of the last ruling monarch or the last caliph, but it's actually um, all of the 
living members of the Ottoman family, including the children and grandchildren of imperial princes and princesses. So there were 155 people, including some infants among them. Uh, so they were deported. Uh, and they were given uh, passports, so this is the first passport I'm going to start with, um, passports that were good for only one year, uh, which would expire in a year without any renewal or any even transit um, uh, visa. So they were given notice, uh, and within a very short period of time, everybody had to leave. Some of them were actually boarded on trains and sent off immediately. Uh, most of their property was confiscated, and a, a vast majority of, of Nilufar's uh, relatives, they scattered all over Europe and mostly on the Mediterranean. They tried to find places whose, uh, where the climate was comparable to Istanbul, Istanbul's climate and near the water. Um, but most of them lived and died in poverty. And we have to also remember that even though a lot of these empires were oops, uh, collapsing, the um, abolition of the position of caliph was no small feat, even though the position had been symbolic for a very long time. Historically, it had existed since the death of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the seventh century. And as we know, until this day, it continues to be a, a controversial topic with uh, certain groups trying to recreate it, different groups laying claim to it, like um, the self-proclaimed Islamic State in Iraq and, and Syria. And the images we have today are very different. So if I were to ask you today, what do you think the caliph looked like in the 1920s, you'll probably have images of, I wouldn't be surprised if the images that came to your mind were images with long robes and big turbans and things of that nature. But um, also this is a critical representation of the new secular regime in Turkey. Turkey. So we, don't, we see the, uh, the caliph being bombed off, if you will, but also other religious leaders are also being sent away. So in this representation, secularism meant complete lack of religion. Um, and the abolition of the caliphate was in the Western press quite um, widely. There are some examples. Um, but here's a picture of the caliph, the last caliph in 1922 with his daughter, Princess Durushehbar, who was in 1922, eight years old, when um, Abdul Mejid was appointed by the Turkish National Assembly to be the, the caliph. So this is after the monarchy was abolished. He was appointed as the caliph. Um, and this is what he looked like. These are later from uh, he, after he settled in Nice in the 1920s. Um, he was in French papers quite frequently. Uh, but it's a very different image than what we might imagine today. And I'm not passing a, um, any kind of judgment on which one is better or which one is the correct version, but I'm just trying to underline, emphasize that there are different ways of uh, either interpreting Islam or becoming caliph. There may be more uh, than we're, we're aware of. This is what he looked like in the 1920s. And here's a picture from the, uh, a day at the beach with some family in front and, uh, and friends. Now, if we go back to our princess, oh, I'm going the wrong way, here. Um, so this is a detail from the first passport that I, um, I've located in the, again, Georgetown uh, archives issued in 1924. Um, and the cover page of the passport, actually when we read the Ottoman Turkish print, clarifies that it was good only for a year. Um, and, um, and here, if we go back, this is an interesting passport because the child, Princess Nilufar, who was eight at the time, uh, appears next to a, a photo of her mother. And I find the passports also interesting because in the process of this, uh, doing research for the project, I learned that the idea of a worldwide passport also came about in the 1920s. Um, to really cope with the consequences of nationalism, imperialism, and decolonization. So the idea of these new nation states deciding who gets to have a passport 
and where they can go with it, where they can travel with it, is a, is a new phenomenon. Uh, and interestingly, in the 1920s, women in the United States, as an example, they couldn't get their own passports in their own maiden names. They were attached to their husband's passports. And if they wanted to travel without their husbands, it was a big issue. So this started a whole movement in the 1920s for women to be able to actually get government documents in their maiden names independently of their, of their husbands. Um, so Nilufar had this passport with her mother. And they first went to Budapest for a while. And then they also eventually ended up in Nice because the caliph had settled there, former caliph had settled there with his uh, uh, family. And uh, Nilufar and her mother, you'll remember her father had died. She, she had a, a maternal uncle that she was close with. So they also settled in Nice. We don't know very much about her life there. So she was eight. Um, she started going to public school, um, whereas by comparison we know that Durushefar, Princess Durushefar, the former caliph's daughter, um, continued to be tutored at home. Uh, Nilufar went to public school. Um, and we know they were in quite terrible financial state. They, this was typical of a lot of the women, so whatever jewelry they could take with, with themselves, they sold those for a while and other valuables, but it was pretty tough. Um, and uh, so in this context, as you can imagine, what I'm calling royal matchmaking in the book becomes very important. If you're living in exile, you have a big problem. Who will your children marry, right? And how will they marry well, right? Uh, you're in a foreign, foreign state, um, and uh, this was a big concern. So, and interestingly, in Nice in the 1920s, there were other royal exiles. So we know some members of the Qajar fa former Qajar family were there. There were some from Russia, uh, and they were visiting with each other. So we know that there was some social interaction and connection between them. Um, but all of these princesses, and uh, there were some younger kids in these pictures, um, the granddaughters of, uh, of the former caliph, who were much younger than Nilufar at the time. But eventually, there was a lot of pressure on these young women to marry well off and influential people, because that was a way through which their families could also live a better life, right, through their marriages. And there is surprisingly little written about these princesses. Those of you who are familiar with um, the scholarship in Turkish might know Murat Bardakçı, who's a journalist and um, histor popular historian. He's written about the um, Ottoman family in exile, and his book, on um, one of the other princesses, Nesli Shah Sultan, was translated into English a few years ago. But there's very little. And um, for the most part, they're treated as mere pawns, the, these, the sort of submissive Muslim women who had to marry in order to please their families. I'm interested in what kind of agency they might have had and what they did with their lives. Um, So the first cluster of letters in correspondence in the uh, Georgetown collection uh, dates back to 1931. So Nilufar is 15 years old. Uh, and they've, at this point, they would have been living in France for about seven years. Um, I believe that they, they, did not, they didn't have French passports, but they had some kind of residency. Um, but they didn't have citizenship. You know, and even today, if you're, if you're not a citizen of, of a particular state, if you're stateless, I'm thinking of Palestinians today, for example, if you're stateless, it, you can't really travel anywhere. It's, it's really important for our identity and our mobility uh, in the modern era to be attached to a, um, to a state. And this wasn't the case, but they were there. Um, and we know that at age 15, Nilufar was traveling possibly by herself, by train, to see relatives in Paris. So the first cluster of letters in 1931, her mother, Adile Sultan, is writing to her almost every day, inquiring about what she's doing. She's borrowing money so she can send Nilufar some money, some pocket money. Um, she's, her health is not well. Um, and the, the first mention of marriage 
specifically first mention of um, a prince appears in a letter dated October 1931, which ended up being about only about a month before she actually married. And in the, so I have the letter from her mother to Nilufar, and uh, she's complaining that Nilufar's last letter to her was very harsh. There are no warm greetings in it. She's not ending it with kisses or, you know, greetings of love. Uh, it's very um, short and uh, rather harsh. And, uh, and we learn that in her letter, Nilufar had said something about princesses not being, princes not being toys. You know, she wrote, Prensler oyuncak değildir. Uh, so I'm, I'm guessing that this is the first time her mother is introducing this idea of possibly marrying this prince from Hyderabad. And she's not reacting very well to it. Maybe she, she's only 15, um, she's still in school, um, but there's this type of pressure to marry. And this is around the time when, um, interestingly, um, the Nizam's family is making arrangements to uh, for the older son of the Nizam to marry Durushefar, Princess Durushefar, the Caliph's daughter. Uh, and somehow Nilufar gets folded into this, and a double wedding takes place um, about a month later in November 1931, so this would be seven years after the initial exile. And Nilufar agrees to marry the younger son of the, of the Nizam. So this is a picture from their wedding um, the taller woman is Princess Durushefar, and the other one is Nilufar. The uh, former caliph is in the middle, and all the granddaughters are in the picture. This wedding took place in the former caliph's residence um, in Nice. It was a fairly simple wedding. Here's another photo. And um, they're not uh, seen in the pictures, but some of the um, represented or, or um, uh, uh, people representing the Nizam side were actually delegates from Hyderabad who um, were uh, in London for the second roundtable conference. So this is when that really important meeting is taking place in London uh, and the um, Nizam's sons were part of the group that was also traveling, uh, and uh, we know that Gandhi was part of that, um, that meeting as well. So there are some really important things happening around this group at the time. So the wedding takes place, um, and the religious ceremony is performed by the former caliph himself, as far as we know. Um, and as you can imagine, so India is under uh, British colonial rule, the um, Gandhi's, in, the independence movement is underway. Um, the caliphate has been abolished, and here we have um, the Nizam of Hyderabad, who was, in 1937, a little bit after this, um, announced as the wealthiest person in the world, right? And Hyderabad at the time was um, a, um, it was an ally of the British Raj, but it was an independent princely Muslim state. Right? So this Nizam was the last hereditary Muslim ruler of Hyderabad before India's independence. So his sons are marrying into the family of the last, last Sunni caliph. So politically and religiously, this was something that gave them a lot of leverage, the Nizam a lot of leverage vis-a-vis -vis his own uh, Muslim uh, subjects. And it was a good match as far as the Ottoman royal family was concerned for the princesses. Um, but if we go back to the pictures here, and I know back then in the 1920s and 30s, people didn't smile a whole lot in the photos like we do today. <laughs> so you don't see cheese and great smiley faces, but they look kind of, they have this pensive expressions almost on their faces, you know, and to me that imp I, I make, it makes me think perhaps this is a reflection of the exiled lives they'd been leading in France until that point and the uncertainty of what awaited them in yet another foreign land. Uh, in India, I mean India, South Asia is culturally very different than both Turkey 
and also from Nice, right? I mean, so to me, these pictures say say a lot, and I I, come, I ask a lot of questions when I when I look at them, because I think until then these women were living in this existential limbo with a destroyed past, a precarious present, and no clear future, right? Um, and so after the wedding. They board the ocean liner Pilsna, um, which um, took them all the way to Bombay. And from there, they, tr they travel to, uh, to Hyderabad. Um, and possibly on the same ship, as I mentioned, the second uh, roundtable conference in London, it's possible that uh, Mohandas Gandhi was on this ship as well. So the dates match. There are some unverified reports that he was on this, on this particular uh, journey on the, uh, at the same time. And there's again one unverified report that he actually had a brief meeting with the princesses on, uh, on the ship. Um, the story is that he was traveling third class, the princesses were traveling first class. He wouldn't go to first class, the princesses wouldn't go to third class. So a compromise was made and they met in a lounge in second class. Um, but again, this is not in any of the sources. It's uh, Mr. Arvind Acharya has written a small um, newspaper piece about its sort of word of mouth that this, is, this might have been possible. Um, even though we can't confirm it, I think this journey was the beginning of Nilufar's immersion into colonial India and South Asian Muslim culture. She does have in the collection letters she exchanged with Nehru, so we know she became acquainted with important political leaders, but there is no, I haven't seen anything in her letters that I've read, her correspondence with any family members about anything that suggests she might have met Gandhi. I think she would have said something. I mean, these letters have a lot of details. I, I you know, my fear is if she had actually met Gandhi, who was at this point fairly well known, um, that it would show up somewhere. But again, I don't have access to all of the documents and it's possible, it's a possibility. Um, and I was able to get a hold of a brochure from 1926 that shows some of the amenities on this ship. So there was a, an op there was a pool, uh, there was a ballroom and a dining room. The middle page down below says there was a gymnasium um, and cinema performances. So it was a fairly comfortable journey that took about, according to, this has some fares, the schedule here, about two weeks. And I think it's possible that the um, newlyweds, they traveled in Europe and the Middle East a little bit. It's possible they boarded the ship at Port Said, um, and that would be about a two-week trip to, uh, to Bombay. It's interesting to imagine what it must have been, have been like. I like it. Um, and waiting for them in Hyderabad was this great celebration. Um, holiday was declared, people came out to see the newlyweds, etc. It was a big uh, welcome party. Um, this, is the, this is a modern picture of, uh, of Chaumala, the four uh, palaces that were residence, residences of the princely family, and it, it's been recently renovated. Um, and uh, I mean, so, so the whole legacy of British, the British uh, era can be, can be seen here, but there was a big reception here, apparently, with the British resident present as well. And um, when they arrived in Hyderabad, the two princesses, they didn't live in the same palace, so they lived in separate residences. Nilufar and her husband, Moazamja, uh, lived in the Hillfort Palace. This is a picture from the 30s. I'm not sure that, that this interior is from the 30s. This hotel was in the 90s. It became a Ritz-Carlton Hotel for a while. Um, this is an earlier photo, but uh, and then it was um, it was abandoned, I believe. But that must have been a difficult thing. My point is to sort of go from from Nice with a cousin. So the two princes princesses are cousins to sort of get married together with your cousin, go to India. And then you know, it would have been probably easier for their integration or an adaptation if they had lived together, but they were in separate residences, not necessarily very far. Um, and just a few words about Hyderabad at the time before I move on. 
Hyderabad, as I said, was uh, important because of, of its political status. And um, my colleague, Eric Beverly, has written a book about uh, its important role. And he talks about what he calls Muslim internationalism. So these um, uh, trends of thought, political thought, as um, borders were again shifting and Muslims were trying to figure out what their future should look like. And at the time, interestingly, a majority of the world's Muslims lived under European control. So the British Empire alone ruled over more Muslims than any single Muslim sovereign at the time. Uh, there's a you know, famous quote by the then Prime Minister Lord, Lord George who said, we are the greatest Mohammedan power in the world and one fourth of the population of the British Empire is Mohammedan. Right? So this is the political environment in which this, all of this is happening. And so Hyderabad was an important part in this Muslim internationalism. And the one strand of this movement focused on reviving the role of the caliph, uh, so reviving the, the, the famous caliphate movement in, uh, in India and, um, and Pakistan, later Pakistan. Um, so there, there was a lot of interest in these uh, princess, Turkish princesses who were also related to, uh, to the caliph. Um, but the correspondence in um, the British archives, the British India office, and the Hyderabad resi papers of the residency suggest that both in Ankara and in London there was great anxiety about what this might mean, right? So, now the Nizam's family is related to the caliph's family. What is this going to create some new kind of political, political tension? How am I doing with time, John, and am I have till one? Yes. Okay. So I'm gonna try to get to some, some photos, more fun things. Um, um, so I'm focusing on examining Nilifar's life in Hyderabad because even though the princesses are typically just um, portrayed as submissive women, like I said, used for political leverage, or just beautiful princesses to look at who were expected to produce male heirs, uh, and they were very beautiful indeed. Um, but when the more I learn about her life, the more I see a strong-willed, intelligent, and rebellious young woman who really pushed the limits of both her own family's expectations and traditional South Asian Muslim, Muslim culture. Um, so this is a detail from her second passport, which she received in 1931, because when she married the Indian prince, by extension, she became a subject of the, of the United Kingdom. So this is her British passport. So she goes from losing your Turkish citizenship to having just residency in France to now having a British uh, passport, which was later repeal, uh, revoked again. Um, here's the passport you see. It says canceled. I'm going to come back to that. But we learned that she was five foot seven, was pretty, pretty tall, um, brown hair, brown eyes. Um, I want to say a few words very quickly. I'll show this to you really quickly because uh, Durushevar and Nilufar were the first princesses to marry important Muslim royalty, but there eventually in the late 30s and 40s there were more. This is one example, Princess Nesli Shah, about wh whom there's actually a book in English, if you're uh, interested. Um, so for a brief period of time, she, was, she actually acted de facto as the uh, Egyptian queen, queen of Egypt. Salma Rauf Hanum also mar married another um, Indian royalty, the Raja of Kotwara, and this, her story was the subject of a now very well-known book you might be familiar with, Kenny Zemurad's Regards from the Dead Princess. She wrote it in French, but uh, it's been um, translated into many, many different languages. Beyond these, there isn't really much um, scholarship or even fiction on the princesses at all. So, a few words, um, time permitting, about what Nilifar's life was like in, in Hyderabad. So um, from the beginning, we know that both princesses were publicly very visible. Uh, and they didn't observe purda or seclusion that was expected of upper class women, not just Muslim, but this is expected of upper class women across all religions in India. And, um, and no one had broken this in the Nizam's tradition. So the princesses were publicly visible, they attended public functions, um, and, and also actively spoke against, um, 
against the Purda. Um, and from this early phase, there are a lot of letters exchanged between Nilfar and her mother. The collection includes the mother's responses because she kept what, what came to her, right? So I, we don't have her letters, but her mother's responses to her. So we know that her early times in Hyderabad was fairly difficult. She's complaining about her husband's, the prince's neglect. Apparently he was quite a flirt. He was flirting with other women and Nilufar was very upset and her mother is giving her a lot of marriage advice. Um, in one letter, she says, um, remember this year for Christmas, Santa brought you a handsome Indian prince because they, they celebrated Christmas and New Year's on the, on the ship at, when they were traveling. Um, and, uh, and so Nilufar is complaining in the letters about this type of neglect and she's missing her mother and asks her to come and visit. And her mother is ill, she can't do that. And her advice is, a girl belongs to her husband after marriage and it's not natural for mothers to be by their married daughters all the time. Instead, she encourages her Nilufar to be grateful for her comfortable lifestyle in contrast to the rest of the family in exile and to live gracefully like a true Ottoman princess. Um, so I'll, I want to show you a few pictures. Nilufar really take this to, to heart at least, looking the looking like a princess part. Of course, what does it mean to be like a princess? But she became famous for, for her uh, saris especially, her fashion, uh, her taste in fashion. Her husband uh, actually hired on multiple occasions professional photographers, so there are tons of photographs of her. Uh, and a lot of them you can see on the internet, but there's quite a few on the, in this collection as well. Um, and some of these photos are like the one on the right, on my right, at least the, the, the full, um, uh, the, the larger one. It's almost erotic, right? It's almost like this, I don't know, it's, it's weird that these photos were um, made public in, and, and um, not just available to us, but uh, it was um, something that the, the Nizam and the sons took pride in. So in a way, there's something, some idea, uh, something associated with modernity and these Turkish princesses, right? So this, um, there is still that Muslim connection, cultural co connection, but they definitely represent something that wasn't, all, that wasn't very common in India at the time. So there are lots of pictures of her wearing different kinds of saris and she came up with unique designs and had uh, French designers make special saris for her. They were often uh, in journals like this. People were talking about her taste in fashion and the designs. Actually about 32 of them are at the Museum of, of Fashion Institute of Technology in New York City and they, they rotate them. You can see them on display. Um, they put on things like this one uh, fairly frequently. Uh, so this is from 1939. So this was so, uh, pretty much the whole time she was princess of Hyderabad. Uh, she was in, in journals, in magazines. She was named as one of the 10 most beautiful women in the world. Um, she uh, got offered parts in Hollywood movies more than once, which she turned down. Uh, so she was, a, she was a face everybody knew in uh, both in Paris and also, uh, also in Hyderabad. Some of these are later photos, but um, there are a lot of pictures like this, this one, like these ones, right? But the point I'm, I'm interested in is how um, her inability to conceive. So she went through multiple treatments in uh, so many experts for fertility, but she wasn't able to conceive. So even though Durushefar, for example, also dedicated some time to charity work, Nilufar really established a public persona that was based almost entirely outside of the royal palace, right? So she was out doing stuff all the time. It must have been emotionally very difficult for her because in the correspondence I see a lot of letters from her mother at inquiring about her her menstrual cycles or uh, relatives sending postcards with pictures of babies on them. <laughs> you know, it's like no pressure, but uh, there definitely was pressure and it must have been really difficult for her uh, to not to have um, been able to have children. And, uh, and this causes a rift in her marriage and uh, she often re retreats to a particular palace that she seems to like in Kashmir. 
uh, there's a telegram that has news of, uh, of mangoes being sent to her from Hyderabad by her father-in-law. Apparently she loved mangoes and she must have been gone for long enough that, uh, so that he thought of sending her a box of mangoes. Um, and um, naturally, people who study Hyderabad and Indian history have um, done some work on her and, and on both of the princesses. And um, they comment that Western ideas of freedom and liberty were embodied in the demeanor of the Turkish princesses and that they broke the barrier of seclusion. Um, and um, so there is both admiration for what they did, but also some criticism, because especially Nilüfer, given that she didn't have children, those of us who have children know that this is not possible. She didn't have children, so she could go party. She loved going to cocktail parties and, um, and late night gatherings, um, which she was criticized for. So the family supported her charity work, but not her, her lifestyle. <clears throat> So I, you know, I'm, I conclude overall that she transgressed the expectations of both her own family uh, and her husband's family and dedicated herself, being unable to conceive, dedicated herself largely to a life of, uh, of charity. Um, so here is some of the things she did. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit so there's time for some conversation afterward. Um, both of the princesses did a lot of public work, but Nilufar started schools for orphan girls, a daycare facility for female workers with children, which is in the 1930s quite progressive, founded an organization to protect child laborers. She ran a number of other organizations, including Hyderabad Women and Children's Medical Aid Society, Hyderabad State Women's Conference. She gave speeches all the time, Hyderabad Women's War Work. She was certified as a nurse during World War II. And she did a lot of fundraising, especially through the Lady Haidari Club, which was an elite women's club. But she also traveled extensively to educate women about the spread of sexually transmitted diseases. Um, so in my book project, I'm in examining, I want to go into detail about this evolution. How did her sort of transition from being a young, I mean, she was young still, but a very young bride and princess to this figure, almost like a really modern, first lady type of figure, you know, we're very used to uh, having male political leaders and the spouses devote themselves to charity, right? Um, and uh, we see that a lot of other Ottoman princesses like Nesli Shah in Egypt and her sisters who also married other Egyptian royalty did the same thing, right? Establishing schools, schools for girls and hospitals. This became a norm and my sense is that Nilfar was really a pioneer in India uh, in this type of work. So, um, this slide didn't show up. That was the foundation stone of the hospital. Um, in 1947, for the first time, she went back to Istanbul briefly on a 15-day transit visa. But it's interesting because it was, she was given a diplomatic 15-day visa as the wife of the Hyderabad prince. So she went as an Indian prince, not as a former Turkish citizen. And in fact, in the interview, there is no mention of her connection to the royal family. It's really bizarre. But in this interview, she talks about what she does uh, most of her, her time. And, and she says three, four days a week, she's actually act actively working in these facilities. But her Turkish is still very good. Uh, impeccable is what the interviewer says. Um, and ironically, she dreams of having a small house on the water. Not a big fancy, fancy life. So I'm coming back to this um, passport, and then I'll show you one more thing, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll stop. Uh, her British passport, this stamp here says, was canceled in Hyderabad at the at, by the Hyderabad residency, 12, September 12, 1946. And I'm not sure why 1946. I had always assumed before I saw this passport that it would be after India's independence in 1947. Um, I know there is some kind of a rebellion, some kind of peasant revolt in 1946 in Hyderabad, but I don't know what happened in 1946 that prompted the uh, cancellation of this, of this passport. Um, and um, in 1947, she was in Paris, um, and um, in she stayed in Paris, and while she was away in 1948, her husband took a second wife. Um, 
and um, and it's interesting he only had daughters with his second wife but um, upon that marriage um, and I I don't yet, yet know how long it took her to actually get a divorce but in 1952 she did get a divorce um, and the Ottomans had a tradition um, when royal princesses married it was written into their marriage contracts that whenever they wanted a divorce they could initiate it which is not the legal tradition which is by the book to go through the legal system and get a divorce. Um, I don't know the details but I know that because she wanted the divorce she lost all of her titles uh, and all of her financial privileges as well. So she got nothing from the, from the Nizam's family for the divorce and stayed in Paris. Um, incidentally, 1952 is also the year uh, in which the Turkish government, the Turkish National Assembly, decided to allow only the female members of the former royal dynasty to, to return. It took another almost 20 years for the male members to be allowed back. But so in 1952, the government passed this decision and she went back to Istanbul after 28 years um, to um, apply and get a Turkish passport, which then she was able to, able to keep. But again, interestingly, unlike most of the other women in her family who returned to Turkey and lived in Istanbul or various other parts of Turkey and died in Turkey, Paris felt more like home to her, and she went back to Paris and stayed there and actually died there. She remarried this American um, diplomat slash filmmaker, Edward Pope, whom she met in, in France. They lived in Paris, and she also died there in 18, 19, 1989 and is, is buried there. So on a last note, um, let me just allow me to say that I'm hoping that with this project, uh, if I can find the right way to tell this fascinating story, that um, Nilufar's own account of war, revolution, exile, and empowerment can be a window into the experiences of Ottoman and Muslim royal women whose stories, I think, uh, still remain largely untold. Thank you very much for your patience. How did I do with time? Okay. Yes. I'm a Muslim. I go to cocktail parties. <laughs> I'm a Muslim. I go to cocktail parties. <laughs> yeah, um, that's a really good question. So her cousin did have children. This is a picture of her with her two sons. Um, and uh, so she fairly quickly uh, had two children with, um, with her husband. And, um, and she didn't get a divorce, but she pretty much moved to London and lived separately from her husband. Um, the, these two boys are alive, and initially they both married Turkish women, so Durushefar made sure that they married Turkish women. And one of them is the lady, Esra, Princess Esra, who renovated the palace that was in the slides. Um, that princess also, I think she had married the younger son. Um, she also divorced her husband, so all these Turkish ladies, <laughs> they were not happy with their um, husbands in India, they eventually got divorces, but she went back and she's actually in charge of the, of the palace archives and museum. She divides her time between, she's in her late 80s, maybe early 90s now. Do they have any oral histories? I'm sorry? Do they have any oral histories? Yeah, this is such a, that's such a wonderful question. So if you, like I was reading, I read quite a lot about the Romanovs and we know so much about what happened to them because they all kept diaries. There are very detailed diaries and accounts of what happened on a daily basis. We just don't have those sources for, um, for this history, unfortunately. Um, but the, um, uh, one of the boys, um, after he divorced, he married a, an, an Australian woman, I believe. And I mean, so they've had multiple, there's an ongoing legal battle in terms of who gets to inherit what. 
because uh, in 1947, India became independent, and Hyderabad, the, the Nizam wanted to uh, join Pakistan for a while, but that didn't materialize, and they, Hyderabad was eventually annexed by India in 1948. So it lost its independent um, status. Um, and uh, so, therefore, the royal titles were all, I mean, everything was confiscated, right? But still they have some wealth, and there's an ongoing legal battle about who gets what and uh, the multiple marriages and children from these multiple marriages. Okay. <laughs> you okay. Actually, you showed the book of Kaniza Murad. Yes. And so I was interested to see the relation, because I know Kaniza Murad. Mm -hmm. I met her, yeah. and I got the book, and yeah. it's a fascinating story. Did the Kaniza Murad eventually get to know uh, Nilkar and yes. she got to know her? Yes, so when, um, so Kenizem Murat was, I mean her mother died very tragically when she was young and she was raised by a, a French family. She didn't know who her parents were for her until she became an adult, I think, and met her, went to uh, India and met her father in her 20s, when she was in her 20s. And it was during the war between India and Pakistan, she was actually a war journalist reporting on the ground what was going on and suddenly it occurred to her she's actually related to an Indian, she's in Pakistan but she's related to an Indian Raja, mm -hmm. right? Um, and felt very, very unsafe but um, apparently her father, the Raja, sent a letter to Nilfaj or to Duru Shehbar in France and said, I have a daughter who's going to school in France, would you please meet her? So they arranged a meeting, Duru Shehbar was maybe out of town or something so she met with Nilfaj and uh, who introduced her to one of these little boys in the picture, one of Duru Shefar's sons, who was going to school in Europe as well, uh, who wanted to marry Kenny Zamorak. Maybe you know the story. Uh, and, and she was quite smitten by this young man, but she was like, I don't know this person. He doesn't know me. How could he possibly want to marry me? This is like he wants to buy me. You know, I'm not going to marry him for the money. And they kind of became friends, but she turned the offer down. And apparently after that, Duru Shehwaj, who would have been her mother-in-law, she had accepted, right, was very, very cold toward her. And, uh, but she kept in touch with Nilufar. In fact, there's a story about a famous brooch that Nilufar had that she had promised to Kenize. So she used to say, when I die, you're going to get this. And Edward Pope apparently did not give it to her. Uh, so there's a lot of gossip. Right about these things, I don't know to what extent they're true. I haven't met Kim Yvette, but I would love to meet her. But um, they definitely knew each other. She, in, in fact, Nidhi was the first person Kim Yvette got to meet from her own family. Yeah. Yeah, great question. There were two questions here. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for this fascinating and edifying presentation. Thank you, you're very welcome. My um, I have a question. I mean, since the caliphate as an institution kind of can't be abolished by a nation state, were any of these um, suitors or descendants ever, you know, a means to say revive the caliphate either in India or I know in Egypt they tried to, you know, yeah. King Farouk tried to do it. I mean, was that a big factor? Interestingly, none of the male members of the Ottoman family did. They were not interested. Right? even as um, reviving the monarchy. But other people that I, in fact, I read somewhere that upon the abolition of the caliphate, in nine different places, people claim right. to be the caliph themselves. Sharif Hussein was one of them. King you know, Farouk was, King was, another. was another one. But not any members of no. the Ottoman family. I mean, I think there was some pressure, pressure, so it's maybe understandable, but in all of the interviews they've given, they talk very, um, Praisingly, very highly of the modern secular republic, because you can see Mustafa Kemal Atatürk didn't, you know, we say he didn't come from the sky with his zembil. Yeah, I mean, he was a he was a product of that of that generation. There was a foundation for this kind of secular thinking in Turkey and outside of Turkey and other places as well. So it was one of the many models that was an answer to the end of colonization and to the formation of nation states. So th these people didn't. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Yes, for recording. Yes. I was going to ask about the, um, their rejection of the Purdah practice. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's a really, really good point and very good question. I don't know for sure, but my sense is, I mean, these hiring professional photographers, I think, speaks to that uh, to some extent, uh, that they were making a statement about having some connection to modern Muslims or, or Western Muslims. Yeah, If you're looking from Hyderabad, the Ottoman Empire or Turkey would be the sort of Western one of the Western frontiers of, of the Muslim world, right? So they definitely represented some progressive values, but maybe not to the extent of, of cocktail parties, going to your, going back to your question. So I don't know if she drank. You can go to a cocktail party. You don't have to have a drink, right? Um, but before her, uh, no royal member of the family had publicly done this. You know, it was appropriate for the women maybe to go to some functions where there were other, other uh, elite women or go do your Lady Haidari elite club thing. But to go and mingle freely with, uh, with others was not the norm. So I, so I think there were mixed messages, but they, they were certainly on display in many ways. In some of the interviews she's given, she talks about how it's in, the, in Murat Bardakcu's, Bardakcu, Bardakcu's book. She says she felt like she was living in two worlds that were four centuries apart. So from her perspective, there's a famous anecdote about the Nizam trying to get their noses pierced, like traditional Indian brides. And they were horrified, right? Um, so I think in some, and in the letters, you can see her distress about not really knowing how to, how to act properly all the time. Yeah. Elephant. I just take one last uh, point. Uh, just wondering how she kind of gained agency throughout all of these different life uh, events uh, through the prism of language, perhaps. Uh, I guess when she was in France, she learned French, uh, schooled in it. Mm -hmm. Was her husband also schooled in French? So they communicated in French, or did she learn Hindi? And therefore, she was able to Right, so the, the lingua franca was English in Hyderabad. Um, so her husband was schooled in London, uh, and she spoke some English, not as fluent in, uh, in it as her French was. Um, and it would have been Urdu in Hyderabad. They spoke, they didn't speak Hindi, it was Urdu. Uh, I, I know that Duru Shefar learned Urdu. But I haven't seen anything uh, about Nilufar that tells me either way. Well, I mean, I'm guessing she learned some. She picked some up while she was there. Yeah. Can we take one last question? Elif had her hand up in the back. Absolutely. Yes.
it's almost like a, a business exchange, a transaction, right? Because in return for these marriages, the Nizam actually um, designated a monthly stipend for the caliph and his family, uh, right? So it was instead of the meher, traditional meher in the um, wedding um, contract, marriage contract, they, they made a deal so that the Nizam would receive a certain amount, I forget how, how much it is, but a significant amount in, uh, in sterling uh, every month, which he was then supposed to distribute to the family members, but according to some rumors, he didn't, or he gave them very little and kept most of it for himself. And actually, Nilufar is negotiating for a separate pension for her own mother, right, for her, her medical treatment. So there is definitely that part. And um, what I want to do in the book is to look at her um, within the context of broader women's movements of women's emancipation in the Muslim world and the broader context. This is the you know, late 20s, early 30s. A lot of things are happening. For example, Halida Edib, Edib goes to Hyderabad. And, uh, and I don't know if it coincides with a time period where Nilufar, maybe she's in Kashmir or someplace else or traveling in Europe. Uh, Halide meets with Duru Shehbar, so in her book um, on India, she writes about the meeting, but Nilufar is non-existent in those exchanges. She's not there. I think the agency is in what they did with that position, right? So having agreed to an arranged marriage um, that came with a title and a position that gave her some power, and she seems to have pushed the limits of that power, right, because she could have just she could have just been a princess, right? And maybe just done the photo shoots and beautiful clothes and jewelry and stuff and nothing else. Uh, but she seems to have gone beyond those borders trying to sort of make a place and a reputation for her. And she really does have a reputation for the public work that she did. There, the, there's a hospital named after her. It's for a hospital for women and children. Again, the story is that she had um, a servant who died in childbirth, which was very common, and she was very upset by this, and that's, that was what gave her the idea to start a hospital for women and children. So I, I think it's in, the agency is in what they did with the power that came with these important prestigious positions they found themselves in, and how far they were willing to uh, go. She was willing to fight for a divorce. Duru Shehvar decided to just move to London and but she didn't get a divorce, right? So I think every individual story has to be looked at individually and then within the broader context as well. I think it would be really interesting to look at what was happening in terms of women's emancipation in Turkey at the time while Nilufar was um, following what was happening or was she only influenced by what was happening in Europe, right? She didn't have any contact with Turkey, but she had contact with Europe. Um, her mother was always sending her magazines, and she loved classical music, so she, uh, her mother was sending her recordings, and uh, she played instruments herself. Um, but sort of very, a lot of Western influence, but you would think she might have been influenced by what was happening in Turkey as well. A lot going on, right? So I think the, the, the bigger picture is to look at this, this story within the broader picture and sort of find a place for it. Absolutely. Well, thank you, everyone. Well, thank you very much. My pleasure.